Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. Is it coming coming across okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, it's absolutely a tremendous pleasure to uh, to be joining joining what looks to be a spectacular conference. Um, uh, I wish I could be uh, in minds in person. Um, fortunately, I'm in California, which explains why uh, many many of my favorite talks I'm going to have to experience a little delayed. But but I uh, I, I look forward to it. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, since this is this is a conference organized by early career people, I wanted to spend the first slide uh, highlighting some of the early career people who uh, who I'm working with who have uh, contributed to all of these results and, and more to come. Um, these, uh, these top three are uh, grad students at Northwestern. This is Suna Zekiolu, Nick Pavao, and Aslan Safi. Ingrid was my, uh, my graduate student at Sacle, but she is now a postdoc uh, in Uppsala. Lorenzo Rodina was uh, one of my first postdocs. Now he's with UTIN in Taiwan, but I think he'll be soon joining uh, Queen Mary. Matt Lewandowski uh, and Bogdan Suika and James Magnin are with me at Northwestern as postdocs and Zenping Yang was a master's student who contributed to one of the first papers I'll be talking about today. All right, so uh, I'd be remiss if I, didn't, uh, if I didn't start a talk like this exposing a picture of the very wide web of theories all related by color kinematics uh, duality and double copy construction um, at tree level and, uh, and perhaps more. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons uh, it's good for me to get this light up here is because I'm not gonna do a great job with uh, the many, many references throughout the literature, but we have uh, two voluminous reviews, uh, one recently at last month with Sajax and before that uh, on the archive. And we're coming out with a color dual white paper, or white paper on double copy more broadly uh, for the snow mass process within the next few days. So, so please uh, keep an eye out on that uh, for that. So, all right, what are we gonna be doing here? Double copy invites us to construct and combine our favorite theories using building blocks, right? And so this is something I think maybe we're all pretty familiar with this, in this conference, we can build super Yang mills with uh, some color building blocks, double copied with vectors, and that's the Susie multiplet. Similarly, I could talk about nonlinear stable model uh, amplitudes in terms of color, and then these uh, special like two derivative scalars, just call pions, Dirac Born and Fold Volk of a call. If I can talk in terms of these pions double copied with the same Susie multiplet I used to create super Yang mills. And of course, I can get super gravity through uh, double copying uh, two copies of these uh, supersymmetric vector multiples with each other. Um, and when I say double copy, right at tree level, there are uh, many, many ways of talking about this. You know, quiet little tie, uh, BCJ, the CHY, um, and these are all really equivalent to tree level. They can talk about the same theories, and they generate. They're carrying around information in the same way. Um, and all of these have, have uh, lifts into talking about loops. But uh, what I'm gonna be talking about uh, the most is, uh, is of course this, and this is, uh, this is the, 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 the idea of using color and kinematics uh, to not only simplify calculations in gauge theory, but then, then uh, naturally lift them into talking about this, participating in this web of theories. Um, is uh, is where I'm going to be. And so let me make it clear at the beginning that this talk will largely be at tree level, but I'm going to be borrowing insight and approaches from loop level. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be refining the language around double copy uh, via something new, relatively new. And this is this idea of um, algebraic composition. The idea, so the idea that uh, you can take color dual weights and compose them with other color dual weights to make new color dual weights of you know, desired algebraic properties. And I just wanna emphasize that this composition isn't what we're doing with double copy. With double copy, we're taking you know, a product between, you know, if sort of traditional double copy, you've got stuff with adjoint uh, you know, color dual structure that you're double copying with other stuff that is adjoint color dual structure and you're building full amplitudes, 
right? And that's fantastic. And that is a type of composition, but that's not the composition I'm talking about. Rather, I'm talking about how to take these guys and put them together to build another version of just this. So if this is a numerator weight that satisfies Jacobian anti-symmetry, um, and this is a numerator weight that satisfies Jacobian anti-symmetry, then I'm gonna build a new numerator, numerator weight that satisfies Jacobian anti-symmetry. Um, and as, uh, as an example that you'll understand a little more in depth, but these pions that make up the nonlinear sigma model, you can think of as an adjoint composition between numerator weights for covariantized free scalars at four points. Uh, and we'll see how that works in some more detail soon. Um, okay, so, but just, uh, just to, to, to get out of the way, the, 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 the end goal of the talk, what I, what I hope to leave you with is this notion that composition lets us build and classify effective field theory operators for gauging gravity theories with a small set of building blocks. Um, and this is really very powerful because, uh, because as, as we'll discuss, uh, one of the challenging things that can occur when you're trying to come up with color dual representations for new theories is um, the computational cost of finding representations that satisfy these constraints, color dual constraints. And so if you have a way of building color dual things without resorting to ons, let's say, that can be incredibly powerful. And then we're going to apply this new technology to talk about uh, N equals 4 supergravity, um, which, as you may know, is a, the first uh, supergravity theory, pure supergravity theory, uh, found to have divergences in four dimensions at a multi-loop level, it divergences of four dimensions. Um, this divergence is related to an anomaly that you can see at one loop, and, uh, and there are ways of building counterterms to handle that anomaly in a color dual manner. But, um, but as I'll discuss, using these tools, it's, uh, it's actually not so hard to see that if you, if you try to engage with these counter terms in a way that maintains double copy consistency um, and uh, factorization of all your amplitudes, uh, you're forced to consider a tower of uh, operators all the way into the ultraviolet. Um, and uh, this tower closes neither Berkowitz, Witten, uh, supergravity, or with the freedom to actually land on the heterotic string. Okay, so effective field theory. So, um, so all, all you need to appreciate what's going on in this talk is that higher derivative operators or counter terms let us parameterize our ignorance of new physics beyond the scales, uh, beyond, beyond uh, the scales, the fields we're describing. Uh, but, but you can parameterize your ignorance of that new physics with your available fields. And so I've written down some toy scalar Lagrangian um, with you know, just normal interactions. And then we're going to start introducing higher derivative operators that are encoding physics that have been integrated out. And there's some mass scale. And these green guys are Wilson coefficients. And what I'd really like uh, to emphasize is these things these Wilson coefficients aren't derived from this theory, right? They parameterize physics that actually exists in the UV completion of this theory, right? So these are free until they're fixed, either against experiment or if you're able to do a calculation in your uh, UV complete theory. The advantage of using effective field theories besides being able to parameterize our ignorance is they let us talk about uh, physics with, the, with the, the, the nouns and verbs relevant to the scale at hand. So, um, you know, so if you're surfing, you know, you don't have to care about the micro, the, you know, the, the micro interactions of all the, the water molecules, you know, you care about the glassy conditions, you know, care about the speed of sound um, and so forth. All right, but what I wanna emphasize is that our goal here is of course not to be calculating um, uh, amplitudes associated with, uh, with uh, scalar higher derivative operators, but, but in general, you regard as much more complex um, uh, higher derivative operators in gauge theories and gravity theories. Uh, but as we'll see, by approaching it in a color dual, uh, in a color dual framework, we find that, that this problem is really no more complex than largely paying attention to how you have to play with scalars. 
Um, maybe this is actually, maybe this is a good time to, to stop for any questions. Do I have any questions so far? Okay, feel free, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question as I'm going. If I start uh, going too fast, or if I, uh, if I you know, leap, uh, leap off into the deep end. Um, so to set the stage for how I'm approaching this, I want to talk about how we calculate bit loops, because um, this is something that uh, even, even in the amplitudes community isn't necessarily universally appreciated. Um, of course, what we all know is we're not using Feynman diagrams. Uh, they're off, they're, uh, they're unwieldy off shell, uh, you're carrying a tremendous amount of verbose information that's got to cancel for any physical, uh, physical observable. Um, and of course, we're plagued with a factorial number of diagrams, which is uh, truly painful as we start to get to higher loops or, or higher multiplicity and both. Uh, but still, we are graph organized and we're graph organized for two reasons. Um, it allows us to engage very, uh, very cleanly with unitarity methods. And unitarity methods are spectacular for both verification to make sure you're talking about what you think you're talking about. But also when you have some, when you have an easy verification, then you've got a natural path towards construction. So unitarity methods have been at the heart of, of, um, of these really these higher loop calculations for quite some time. Um, there's another reason why we're graph organized, and that's because at the end of the day, uh, one, one does want to integrate. And uh, this integrate over, over a virtual loop event, uh, uh, the, the technology that, that we have available, and this isn't necessarily going to always be the case, but right now, if we actually want to integrate, we want local representations. And so even if you have some sort of uh, non-local in loop memento way of generating an integrand that's true, that satisfies all cuts and stuff, if you want to integrate it, you still have to find a way to push it into local representations. Um, and so, uh, and in fact, in unitary methods can, can and often do help with that. Okay, so, so let me talk about what's involved with a gauge theory loop integrand map. So a loop integrand map is a mapping from a label topology. And here, you know, let me zoom in on this. I've drawn some non-planar for loop diagram uh, and I'm allowing multiple particles to be running around. Um, and I guess uh, probably the conceit is these green guys and these red guys are gonna be massive. And these blue guys are gonna be massless. All right, and but what we want, we want some mapping from a label topology, some labeled graph that encodes structure uh, to color weights, right? And so either you know, our standard adjoint for, for stuff that uh, tends to be massless in the adjoint uh, to, uh, to arbitrary color weights, uh, you know, for, for whatever representation uh, things are in our theory. Um, right, so we're gonna have some map to color weights, we're gonna have some map to propagator weights, and we'll have some map uh, to, kinematic numerator weights. And this is, of course, the numerator weights that, uh, that we like to talk to in a, in a colored dual conference. Um, this is gonna care about momentum and polarizations and the such. Now, one thing that all of our weights need to obey uh, are the symmetries of the topology. Otherwise, they're, um, they're useless for addressing, all right? So, so let's, Let's, I've drawn in this, in this corner up here, um, I've drawn the corner up here, you know, some topology closely related to the topology above. And, you know, let's say we've got our mappings in terms of labels we've given the various, um, you know, the various external edges. And, you know, of course, we you have to label your internal, uh, your internal momenta as well. Um, and, uh, and and uh, you're going to turn this. You're going to turn this into, you know, of course, propagator labels, and color labels, and and the challenge are the kinematic numerator labels. And what has to be true for us to use it without a tremendous amount of extra bookkeeping is that when we ask ourselves um, how should we dress something with these particular labels, it shouldn't matter whether we chose, for example, uh, 
A to map to K1 and uh, K4 to map to, sorry, and, and B, B to map to K4 and E to map to K3, right? So this is, this is one valid set of mappings, or of course I could have chosen A to map to K4 and B to map to K1. Still E is gonna map to K3 because it's our only external blue or external you know, massless photon or whatever we're dressing. Um, I hope you understand the distinction here. I'm, what I'm really talking about is I'm talking about the various automorphisms of this graph. Right, and the reason this is important is because when we're dressing a cut, nobody's telling us, you know, which one should be A and which one should be B. So this is a critical part of, of how, we're dress, how we're dressing our integrands, how we're understanding our integrands, is that things maintain this sort of automorphism symmetry. Um, so so that, that, that adds a layer of complication um, to what we're doing, uh, to imposing these, these automorphism constraints. But in, uh, in another sense, it makes our lives much, much, much easier because uh, we don't, because we only have to address any topology once. Um, and so how do we calculate? We give an ansatz to our topologies, we fix some symmetries and cuts, and, uh, and, and, then, and then we're good. Once, once we satisfy all the cuts uh, and, and in, a, in a symmetric manner, then we're ready to calculate. We can actually build the integrand we want to integrate out of the numerators, the color factors, and the propagators. Um, and this is some place where the duality between color and kinematics can naturally help. It reduces, you know, it, it reduces the number of, uh, of topologies in any given loop order or multiplicity to, to a much smaller number of basis uh, graphs. Um, and uh, I think for this audience, I probably don't need to jump into this too much, but I'll just mention this really quickly. Um, you know, color weights are, uh, for example, related by Jacobi relations. And uh, the color weight of this graph is gonna be the color weight of this graph uh, plus the color weight of this graph. You know, and this is just by considering a Jacobi around an edge like this. And so what do we do with the duality between color kinematics is we demand this holds for our, our kinematic weights as well, right? And so, you know, via this, we have, we have some pretty striking results that we can encode all of three loop four point n equals five super angles in the dressing of one topology. In fact, this uh, sort of half ladder guy is, uh, is more than sufficient uh, to, to capture everything. You only need one uh, non-planar guy at four loops. Um, uh, but, but what I'd like everybody to realize, and this is a little different than, than games you can play at tree level, is there are feedback constraints. Um, and, uh, and so, so these Jacobi relations at, at loop level are really functional. And, and, uh, the only way until somebody, uh, hands us, hands us, um, color dual structure factors that we can use at high loop order is, is right now still to use an ansatz. Um, and let me, let me make it real clear what's going on. In this example, I've written down, we're considering a Jacobi on, uh, on this edge. And so we get a triangle diagram and this box diagram, there's some theories where you may choose to never dress a triangle diagram with anything but zero. And so you have this functional relationship between um, between a numerator for your ladder diagram, you know, A, B, C, D has to equal your numerator for the ladder, A, B, D, C. All right, so we've got these two, these two uh, fl flipping spots. And so this is a functional constraint on, you know, the type of function this is. And so there's this type of feedback all over the place. This is just a, a simple example. Um, so again, onzatse, onzatse are, are quite natural. So they're natural for us from a cut construction perspective and they're natural for us <coughs> from satisfying color kinematics uh, functionally. But uh, even though they're natural doesn't mean they're, they're pain free. In fact, right now we don't know if there's a color dual representation that's local, that's compatible with supersymmetry 
for n equals four super Yang mills at five loops. Um, because we haven't been able to try a spanning ansatz, it's just too large. What we know is that um, is that the friend, friendliest ansatz in, in uh, manifest power counting don't, don't satisfy the constraints, but we haven't even been able to rule out uh, uh, many orders above, above that friendly ansatz, not to mention, not to mention non-local. Right. So, so, so even though, even though Anzat say are our friends, when, um, when satisfying, when satisfying, uh, finding color dual representations, they really can get quite expensive. Okay. So back to the, back to the main subject of this talk, higher derivative operators. So these, uh, proliferation of derivatives in the action, they're going to turn into various, uh, momenta that we're going to be sprinkling in our scattering amplitudes. And so the game we have to play is to figure out all the distinct ways of sprinkling in some order and mass dimension number of uh, momenta into our scattering amplitudes. And I'm going to, I'm going to highlight this without messing up, without messing with our symmetries, right? Because if we mess with the symmetries, we're not talking about the theories we want to be talking about. Um, and so of course, uh, I, I hope I hope everybody can appreciate that the simplest thing you can possibly do at um, at any multiplicity and uh, you know and indeed at any loop order um, is to multiply uh, multiply in with scalar permutation invariance. So this is an easy way of turning turning an amplitude into an amplitude that's associated with a higher derivative operator. You just multiply by uh, scalar permutation invariance and eventually you'll have eaten up all the propagators and then, uh, and then you're talking about local counter terms and then you can keep doing this uh, all the way up the UV. Um, and of course, that's true. Many fantastic higher derivative operators, their scattering amplitudes are simply scalar permutation invariance times known amplitudes, um, but that's not everything, okay? And we're gonna look for uh, constructive ways of, 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 uh, of building these things, okay? And so, um, and so we're gonna start with a four point tree level just because it's a great place to start and it's a great way to find true things. Um, and I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation just to make it uh, easier, I hope for you to actually follow. And see, this is actually this is a fun thing. So, so you know, I, I grew up in some sense giving talks about uh, very high loop order, and it's fun to have an, an excuse to talk about something at trees where everybody, I think, can really follow along um, uh, with, with what's going on. And and I could really have given this as as a blackboard talk. Um, all right. So so okay. So. What we've got is we've got uh, three cubic graphs at four point. Uh, we've got what I'm calling the, uh, the S graph, which is just going to be K1 plus K2 squared. We've got the T graph, which is going to have a propagator of K1 plus K4 squared, and the U graph, which is a propagator of K1 plus K3 squared. Um, I'm going to label the graphs that I'm talking about with diff by different permutations of the Mandel stems, S, T, and U. And the reason is there's only one topology at four points, it's this particular half ladder. Um, and the different channels are just different ways of labeling the same topology. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm gonna label the graph first with its first argument, talking about the momenta that's running across um, that's running across uh, the, the propagator, right? So this momenta S is running across this propagator. I'm going to label the second Mandel stem with what's with the, 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 local, the local cross. So in this case, you know, a T is like a K1 plus K4 squared, right? Similarly, if I was talking about um, the T diagram, I would have called the first guy, I would have called the first guy a T because T is what's running across. And I would have called the second guy an S because the S is running like this. Now you could ask what you need the last guy for. 
And the last, the last file in combination with the second guy gives you a sign. So I'm gonna label, let me choose a different color. So I'm gonna label this last guy, of course, is this cross right here, the U. And what happens when I swap T and U here, I still get the same propagator structure, right? I still have K1, K2 vertex. You know, and it, it's absolutely independent whether I flip this vertex or this vertex, which is why I don't actually have to specify all four labels. I can just talk about uh, S, T, and U. So S, T, and U. Um, so the graph label by S, T, U is just my normal S channel graph, and S, U, T is just going to be my S bar graph where I've flipped one of these vertices. Um, I think this should be comfortable for everybody who's been playing around with FABCs that are graphs are graphs with structure. We really care about the order in which we traverse uh, a vertex. And so this is just a handy way of labeling things so that, um, so that when I do some examples in a slide or two, you'll be able to follow along with what I'm talking about. Um, good. All right, so what are the adjoint conditions? The adjoint conditions are that we satisfy Jacobi, and anti-symmetry. Um, and if we can satisfy these conditions, then we can participate in the standard double copy web, web of threes, that whole slide on the front, right? I can peel off things and stick back other things as long as I'm talking in this language of satisfying um, Jacobian anti-symmetry on various uh, legs. Um, good, and just to make it very clear, right? This is my S channel graph, STU has to be my T channel graph plus my U channel graph. Now, I know a lot of you, um, some of my colleagues and even me on certain days, prefer to write the Jacobis in terms of, you know, uh, CS plus CT plus CU equals zero. And that's a perfectly fine choice. But, um, but, uh, but if I ever have to explain things to people, as I may often have to do during talks, uh, I resort to a place where I'm most comfortable. And I learned this stuff uh, in particular, in particular three loop cuts that had these configurations. So, uh, so you're, you're, stuck, you're stuck with my convention for this talk. Um, and I hope, I hope you can be flexible enough to, to participate in it. Um, okay, so again, so the conditions are uh, Jacobi. And if we flip uh, the back for permute one of these edges, we have to pick up a minus sign. Now, um, let's talk about an example. And uh, a beautiful, lovely, and simple example is the covariantized free scalar. Uh, and this covariantized free scalar is spectacularly simple because it's free. It's just talking to, it's just talking to, to it's just coupled with, uh, with uh, glue here. And, um, and it's just got one derivative. So at four points, I'm going to be linear in Mandelstam invariance, right? Four points, I'll just be dotting a, you know, a Ki with a Kj. And so the question is, is there a color dual representation for this theory? And uh, of course there is for this simple scalar, uh, the mapping for a graph like this, a mapping for a graph that's simply A, B, C, sorry. A mapping that is one, one, two, three, four, right, is going to be, um, is going to be uh, N, S, T, U, right? And so the mapping is going to be T minus U. And we can see that this does in fact satisfy uh, Jacobian anti-symmetry quite simply. So this is, uh, you know, T minus U is the S graph, right? And S minus U, is the T graph and T minus S is, um, is the contribution from the U graph. And of course, T minus U is T minus U. And this trivially obeys uh, the anti-symmetry condition. All right, so the covariantized free scalar is, uh, is of adjoint type. It satisfies what we need at four points to participate in the color dual web of theories. Um, so what can we do with it? Well, um, 
Well, one of the things, one of the, 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 the most straightforward thing you can do with something uh, that satisfies a Jacobian anti-symmetry is build permutation invariants out of it. Um, and so, you know, permutation invariants at four point are uh, so trivial, it, it, it was hard to even justify uh, making a slide for it. But the idea is if I've got some weight uh, that's a you know the the care that that's supposed to be permutation invariant that I can swap any legs and it's not going to care at all. And an example of something, of course, that is permutation invariant is um, st a you know st. For example, the Yang Mills for anything anything that satisfies the the color dual uh, identities. If this is an ordered amplitude, then you've got a permutation invariant right here. So that could be a permutation invariant. Uh, kinematic weight, if you like. Um, of course, you can have permutation invariant color weights like a DABCD, which is just a normalized sum over all the uh, color traces. Good. Now, one thing you should note is there's no linear permutation environment for uh, massless theories. And this is because S plus T plus U equals zero. So you don't have a linear permutation invariant uh, at four point, but you can always compose as we adjoint things with themselves to get permutation invariants. And that's just by summing over all the channels, right? And so it's trivial to build a, a, a order two permutation invariant in kinematic weights by just composing our simple scalar numerator, our linear building block with itself. And of course you get what you expect, S squared plus D squared, um, which we uh, associate with uh, or we call sigma two. And this is just a, a sort of standard name in the literature for the quadratic and Mandelstam invariants uh, uh, permutation invariant at four points. Um, uh, so here's, here's our first composition. Our first composition is whenever somebody hands you uh, adjoint representations, you can always build a permutation invariant out of it. Um, and this is of course true at, at any multiplicity, you know, I've just given this example of four point. Um, uh, you should also notice that there's another, there's another, um, there's another composition rule we get for free, which is whenever you have a permutation invariant and something that's uh, that's uh, of adjoint type, you can always compose them trivially through uh, multiplication. That if I have something that satisfies the adjoint relations and I multiply by a permutation invariant, it's still always going to satisfy the adjoint relations. It's never it's never going to stop. Um, so that's the whole point of permutation invariants is to uh, is to ride along for free with these algebras. Um, uh, so um, so now let's introduce adjoint composition of four points. So I promised that you could take uh, these colored dual building blocks and put them together with each other to build more colored dual building blocks. And at four points, it's very straightforward that if I want to build something that's, uh, if I want to build, if I've got two different, and so I've got a tilde adjoint satisfying numerator and a, uh, I don't know, inverse carotid adjoint satisfying numerator, then I compose them by saying that my functional S channel is just uh, going to be the product of the T's minus the product of the U's. And, uh, and this is absolutely true that if I compose two functional adjoint weights this way, I'll get another functional adjoint this way. And of course, NT and NU just come functionally by relabeling. All right, and so you can ask what happens when you compose the simple scalar with the simple scalar and you get the pi on as I promised earlier. You'll get something that's proportional to S T minus U. This is at the numerator level. And what we've done is we've climbed one rung in mass dimension because this simple scalar building block is a, is a unit step, right? And since we can compose, we can just climb one unit in mass dimension. Um, so we get, uh, we get our pi on amplitudes, and now we can ask what type of permutation invariant we get by combining our symbol scalar with our pi on um, in a permutation invariant way, which if you'll recall is just summing over the channels. And of course, uh, you'll get something that's proportional to S times T times U. 
um, which we call sigma three. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and you know, as you expect, you know, with permuting um, this uh, this pion in a permutation, sorry, composing this pion with itself to get a permutation invariant, of course, is just sigma two uh, times sigma two, which uh, which uh, which is going to be proportional to s squared plus t squared plus t squared squared. And, and the thing is, um, is these permutation invariants, sigma two and sigma three, they span all the permutation invariants uh, uh, to, all, uh, to all orders in mass dimension. So, um, so if you've got a permutation invariant in a particular mass dimension, then you can fit to it with uh, with an ensemble in terms of uh, the relevant powers of sigma two and sigma three, <clears throat> uh, but uh, more to the point of adjoint color dual, this simple covariantized scalar spans all scalar adjoint type building blocks under composition. So this guy, this guy we wrote down just a, a few minutes ago, the simple T minus U climbs a ladder mass dimension by mass dimension. And this ladder closes after the second rung under permutation invariance. So if you climb the net linear sigma model, um, if you climb using the simple scale, you, you, you compose it with the pion, you'll just get something that you could have talked about in terms of simple scalar and pions times permutation invariance. So let me, let me make this very, very concrete. For any arbitrary mass dimension composed simply of scalars at four points, massless scalars, um, the numerator can be given by permutation invariance times uh, the symbol scalar numerators and permutation invariance times, um, times, uh, times the pion. And there is nothing else. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Of course, you can add color, right? And so what color weights do we have around at four points? Well, we've got the standard adjoint color weight and we've got this nice permutation invariant DBCD. And you can add these color to the various numerators using composition in the relevant ways. For example, you can add color to this pions um, while maintaining an adjoint structure by simply multiplying <coughs> by, um, by the permutation variant, by taking this uh, this permutation and adjoint composition. Um, so, uh, so this is this is something fun. This is a fun observation. Uh, the amplitude associated with uh, the supersymmetric trace f to the fourth is uh, is d a b c d times uh, s t a angles. Because this is a notice. This is a permutation variant, and this is a permutation variant. And uh, it was noted by uh, Brodel and Dixon that, of course, if you color strip this amplitude, right, you'll be looking at something that looks like this, and it's permutation invariant. So this thing isn't going to satisfy the uh, the uh, you know what they call the BCJ relations, these, these n minus three factorial basis relations that um, that uh, that let you. Uh, create things with standard double copy, right? So you can't take something like this and stick it into KLT, for example, um, uh, because, because it doesn't satisfy, you know, the standard KLT. You'll, you'll hear about generalizations of KLT later that let you play with permutation invariance, stuff like this. But, um, but, uh, but the reason is, you know, because this guy is permutation invariant. But, that doesn't mean that this isn't a double copy. In fact, it is a double copy. It's a standard double copy. It's a standard double copy between the pi's I just wrote down, the D, A, B, C, Ds, you know, times uh, the, the simple scalar, I'm sorry, the, the simple scalar composed with itself, these uh, pi and amplitudes, you know, adjoint double copied with, uh, with Yang Mills or supersymmetric Yang Mills. Um, right. Good. So, so you know, you've seen even with just the stuff I've already written down, um, some some non-trivial uh, amplitudes associated with higher derivative operators popping out. Um, in fact, this lets us do a lot. This allows us to close to recover open and closed superstrings at tree level as field theory double copies, just from these scalar permutation invariants, scalar adjoint numerators. 
simple single trace color rates, FABC and this DBCD, uh, and the super Yangville's numerator. All right, so, so the, the Yangville's numerator four point is secretly super symmetric. And so you can get everybody else and it's multiplied by just uh, acting with super symmetric order genius. Um, now, what I, what I want you to notice though, is how many <coughs> independent pieces you have here. We have this, we have this, we have this, and we have this. All of these guys, just came from this linear, this linear building block composed by itself in various ways until closure under permutation invariance. And then you can use permutation invariance to get everything else. And quite literally, this lets you span uh, the open and closed uh, superstring. The open superstring um, at tree level four point is given by a, a Shan Payton dressed Z theory amplitude, uh, double copied with, you know, the super. Mills multiplet. And the closed superstring is given by, um, by uh, Super Yang Mills, uh, double copied with um, a single value upgraded Super Yang Mills. And so the Z theory amplitude um, is literally, so I'm, I'm using sort of an Einstein summation notation. So I'm summing over all the mass dimensions all the way up. And these are Wilson coefficients. And these are Wilson, these are very special Wilson coefficients, right? This is where all your multiple zeta values are, are hiding that give you string theory. But you can pull, you can actually pull apart the um, the resummed structure of the open superstring into exactly this uh, into exactly this form. And uh, this single valued upgrade, I might have I might have some time to say a little bit more about this later. You can think of it as the color strip z theory. String theory double copied with the color stripped Z theory, then double copied into something. But at four points, it's just a sum over um, over permutation invariance, and then the single value multiple zeta values, right? And so, uh, so we've seen with some spectacularly small number of building blocks, you can span all the higher derivative operators that contribute to uh, to super symmetric string theory. So composition is very powerful. Um, and I could point out that you could, I could verify these relations because, because these compositions are so simple, you could verify them up to insanely high mass dimension, like you know, alpha prime to the 40, uh, before finding the right way to drive it in terms of the, the actual like Euler gamma functions at four points. Um, in fact, the most expensive part of this was the series expanding of the alpha prime of the string theory, not, not the composition at all. Um, and so you can check out you can check out the paper for examples and proofs. Um, let's see how much how much time do I have? Um, about five minutes. Um, maybe a few more than that if necessary. Okay. Let me let me go uh, uh, a little a little more quickly then. So, um, why why haven't I talked about adjoint composition with um, with the vector theory? Uh, and it's because the resulting numerators, they do satisfy adjoint constraints, but not gauge invariance. Um, so what about other tensor structures? Turns out there are eight spanning building blocks at four points. Um, there's uh, Yang-Mills, there's a single insertion of trace of F cubed plus two more that ultimately related to the DF squared theory. Um, two insertions of trace F cubed, but it requires a you know, trace after the four. To, to make a color dual and the two more at this mass dimension and then a d squared f to the four. And all the other local color dual vectors uh, are spanned by these and permutation invariants. So this, this is the basis that lets you talk about all, um, all color dual vectors. Uh, and so any, any, any uh, higher derivative operator at four points for, um, for vectors are spanned by this or some combination of the modified color dual uh, scalar weights above. Uh, and similarly for, uh, for gravity theories, if you have a higher derivative operator that you can't describe in terms of these guys, then it's not describable in terms of something that's adjoint to color dual of four point. Um, uh, for example, these guys are sufficient to span the bosonic string. Uh, you can ask, can these, uh, can these eight point guys be algebraically constructed uh, themselves. Can you build 
these things out of polarization scalar weights such that such that these aren't your atomic building blocks, but then the result of some, some generalized composition process. The fact that I'm asking that question sounds very positive, but for the official word, uh, you're gonna have to stay tuned for uh, something we'll be putting out very soon. Okay, is this just a feature four point? No, five points is even richer and you've got a fascinating surprise that the actual building block for odd multiplicity isn't adjoint, but something that's just like adjoint, it's antisymmetric on the external end, satisfies Jacobi, but you relax the antisymmetry on, uh, on the central edge. Um, and so it's, it's got a very simple building block. And in fact, this generalizes to all multiplicity. Um, it's such a rich structure of five points. I don't have any time to get into it now. Um, uh, there's, there's a question still, still looming even after five points, which is the number of vector adjoint color dual building blocks. This is absolutely an open question. Um, even, even five points spanning all the possible color tools becomes very exhausting very quickly, which is motivating the constructive approach. <gasps> <coughs> that, uh, that I hope to be able to talk about soon. All right, so in my final few minutes, I'm gonna talk about the color dual fate of N equals four supergravity and, and, and uh, tease you with, with something that I think, I think is, 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 uh, is, is very, very exciting. Um, this, is, this is a recent paper we just put out uh, like a month or so ago. Um, so, let me, let me talk for half a second about the anomalous behavior. Uh, one loop for uh, n equals four supergravity at tree level, two scalars to two, uh, to two gravitons is zero, but at loop level in uh, n equals four, it's not. Um, and, uh, and you can understand this behavior via double copy that half maximal supergravity you can talk about its amplitudes in terms of maximal super Yang mills and pure Yang mills. And so this anomalous behavior, you can understand as this double copy between external gluons and external gluons. And in your supersymmetric theory, you can only have MHV, but in your pure, uh, in your pure Yang mills theory at tree level where it's super, secretly supersymmetric, this is gonna vanish, but at loop level, it doesn't vanish. Um, and so to cancel the anomaly, you need a counter term that admits, uh, in a sense, if you're going to build it in a double coffee way, that admits a sort of four D pluses, even at tree level. And, and this is, this is uh, trace F cubed. Um, and, uh, and it has been shown that including this trace F cubed type counter terms does render the theory anomaly free at one loop and does not spoil the UV behavior through two loops. We await uh, higher loop calculations to make sure it doesn't spoil at, at uh, three loops. And in fact, uh, what it does at four loops. But what you can ask, and this is a question uh, my postdoc and student and I were asking is, um, is this theory trace F squared plus alpha prime trace F cubed double copy consistent? I, is it color dual and factorizing for all multiplicity tree level? And it sure is at three points. Um, this is anti-symmetric, and that's all you need. Uh, at four points, of course, Yang and Mills is single insertion of, um, of trace F cubed is the double insertion isn't. It needs this four point trace F to the four uh, counter term that I mentioned above. So I need to add something to the action I wrote down above. I need to add this operator to make the alpha prime double insertion. So the alpha prime squared contribution of the theory uh, uh, color dual, that's fine. So now you can ask is trace F squared plus alpha prime trace F cubed plus dot, 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 double copy consistent with a finite number of counter terms? And apparently not. And it's not just that you need a new counter term at every multiplicity. The surprise is, is it looks like we need a tower of counter terms Right, uh, right between four and five points, reaching all the way to the ultraviolet. Um, and so, so I said we had this alpha prime uh, squared counter term um, that uh, that we needed to add to get to get the alpha prime squared, the double insertion of trace F cubed to work at four points. Now, if I have this operator, I have to consider 
what's going on at alpha prime cubed at five points. Now I had to consider alpha prime cubed at five points anyway, because of three insertions of um, three insertions of the trace of cubed. But the only way, the only way this is color, this is consistent with double kinematics is if it factorizes to something that yes, includes this counter term, but also requires an additional new alpha prime cubed counter term at, at three, uh, at alpha prime, yeah, alpha prime three, the mass dimension alpha prime cubed relative to, um, to pure Young Mills. Now, what's going on is this is the same factorization. It's just that three points has an alpha prime from the trace F cubed that lifts mass dimension. And it's also got, um, it's also got you know, the normal trace F squared, which brings things along parallel. Now, it could have been in a magical world that's different from ours, that five points was sufficiently flexible to never require this counter term to show up, but that's not the way the world works. This absolutely requires the presence of this counter term, at which point we're forced to consider this contribution of five points at alpha prime to the four. And the only way for this to be colored dual is if it factorizes and also includes uh, an alpha prime to the four. And so this ladder just keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. Um, requiring color kinetics and factorization even between four and five point induces a tower all the way to the ultraviolet. Um, uh, let me briefly say how you can tell. The way you can tell is, um, is by giving an ansatz. And you can give an ansatz in terms of the eight simple vector building blocks I gave you before and all orders in um, in permutation variance up to what you're going to be checking. So uh, we checked through um, alpha prime to the four, uh, not because of any, any trickiness on four points. It's actually because we don't have this basis of vectors at five point yet. We just have a basis of the, the scalar operators, um, the onsots, uh, while even checking alpha prime to the, to the four uh, got, would became you know, tremendous, like 50,000 parameters. Um, so, uh, so in any case, so, you know, so this, this is definitely going to color dual. You, you fix on factorization. So it's talking about the theory you're talking about, right? And so figuring on factorization to, you know, trace F squared and trace F cubed fixes uh, through alpha prime squared, but then we've got free coefficients. And these C's, these C's are unconstrained. They could be zero unless consideration of five point forces them to take on particular values, at which point then things start feeding into higher and higher mass dimension, uh, which it does. Uh, this is just feedback from five point color kinematics and factorization. Um, uh, things are set to, things are set to, to unity um, with a free coefficient. And so what it looks like is including trace F cubed, uh, Tiang Mills and demanding color kinematics and factorization forces you to close to uh, DF squared plus Yang Mills. Now, DF squared is a very special theory. Um, this is something that double copies with DF squared by itself. This is something that double copies with Yang Mills to make uh, conformal gravity theories or super conformal gravity theories. So it's got this whole order in uh, counter terms. TF squared plus Yang Mills, you saw earlier, it, it modulo uh, Z theory is, um, is the bosonic string. Um, so, uh, I'm so. Sorry, we are almost out of time. I'm very sorry. For yep, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll wrap it up on this slide. All right. Okay. Um, actually, how about this? How about I, I'll, I'll create a new, well, let me get rid of that. Let me, um, okay, good. So, so the punchline, the punchline is n equals four supergravity. Uh, if you try to, if you try to, if you try to add counter terms to deal with, um, to deal with, uh, to deal with anomaly.
and you demand color kinematics consistency, you can demand double copy consistency, this turns into DF squared plus Yang Mills plus additional freedom. Um, so this lands you on either uh, Berkowitz, Newton, supergravity, or you can use this additional freedom with a single valued map to take you to the gravitational uh, amplitudes of the heterotic, heterotic string. Which uh, admittedly, you know, does deal with your UV uh, issues, but at the cost of uh, field theory locality. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for the very nice and interesting talk. So I would keep the question time for now. Question can be asked at the end of the last talk of the day. That is the next one. So uh, let me introduce the next speaker that is Enric Johansson. And he will talk about recent progress on the kinematic algebra. Yes, hello. Um, let me try to share the screen.